Hi, everyone. Welcome to our panel, The Next Evolution of Tech for Good, Inclusivity in Tech Jobs. I'm really excited to be on this, uh, to be facilitating this panel of um, amazing experts in this space. Um, and I'm going to start sharing my screen to get us started. Um, and just excited to be part of Sun Gulf. Uh, I think I was probably part of the first one that was held in Mumbai in person, looking forward to when we're all back in person, but uh, for now we've got the virtual space. Um, so let's get straight into it. Uh, we already have our panelists on the screen, as you can see, and these are their names and their contact details. My name is Rita Sony. I'm Principal Analyst for Impact Sourcing and Sustainability Research at Everest Group. Um, and I'd love it if my fellow panelists um, can introduce themselves and, and we can get started from here. Honey, do you want to get us started? Perfect. Uh, thank you very much, Rita, and thank you for uh, having me on, on this panel. Um, so I'm Hannah Ichino. I am in charge of the ESG strategy uh, for the Web Health Group, so ESG being environment, social, and governments, which includes um, impact uh, sourcing, of course, and we are uh, a leader in terms of uh, BPO. Um, we have 110,000 people across 58 countries now. So it's a very exciting journey to work on impact sourcing across the world. Great, great. Tracy. Excellent. Hi, Rita. Thanks so much. Really excited to be on this forum and something that um, the world needs to be chatting about at the moment. So Tracy Freeman, I look after investors and marketing for the Trade Body and Industry Association in South Africa called BAPESA. Um, a passion point for me is the impact sourcing um, space and a project that I was quite involved in when we first sort of started framing it out with the Rockefeller Foundation many years ago. So looking forward to today's conversation. Thank you. Money. Hi, Rita and uh, everyone. Happy to be here and uh, happy to represent the sole representative of the 50% of humanity in this panel. Uh, but I represent Desi Crew. I am the CEO of Desi Crew. Uh, Desi Crew was born 15 years back in IIT Madras. And uh, the idea is to connect the three dots, which is jobs, technology, and uh, rural India. Of course, the rural India has now become global. Uh, definitions of jobs have been changing and tech, of course, is being tech is changing by the minute. Uh, the core purpose remains and we are 1,500 people strong serving customers across the globe. We are a digital operations company covering digital data, content and uh, AML services. I'm delighted to be here part of this panel. We should also thank the organizers because uh, like you said in Mumbai 2009, Desi Crew was uh, identified as uh, one of the scalable social enterprise when we are just about 100, 100 people on. So I'm happy to be here and looking forward to this exciting conversation and fellow panelists. Fantastic. And Wendy. Hi, Rita. Um, pleasure to be here and pleasure to be here with uh, an amazing group of panelists. So thank you for having me. Uh, I'm the CEO of Asama. So Samo was founded actually back in 2008 um, as a uh, uh, like uh, like Mani, one of the uh, the OGs of uh, impact sourcing. Um, we have a purposeful hiring model focused on uh, underserved communities. Um, our main bases are in Kenya and Uganda, both in urban and rural locations. And we also focus on gender inclusivity. So we hire at least 50 percent women. Um, really glad to be here and share experiences. Thank you. Thanks so much, everyone. So let's get straight into it. Um, we have a few slides to present, but most of this is about conversation. And while we have Q&A at the end, please do uh, put your questions in chat or if you're on the app, in the app chat function, um, we'd, we'd be happy to answer along the way. So quick overview of what is impact sourcing, both in traditional service providers and in the specialist providers that, that we see here. We'll get into the partnership ecosystem and why that's important in impact sourcing, and then down to the real thing of how real people's lives are getting impacted by this model. The COVID-19 pandemic has exposed a national workforce in need of stability. 
unemployment levels soared early in the pandemic. And even when businesses began humming again, we saw a mismatch of skills and job openings. While businesses seek and engage in the reliable workforce, many people, particularly in marginalized communities, are excluded from work opportunities that offer them dignity and a decent livelihood. Today, I'm proud to announce a commitment by Everest Group to address this employment challenge in the global services industry. Together with its partners, Everest Group will help businesses hire, train, and retain a more stable workforce through impact sourcing. The hiring of traditionally marginalized workers, including women, young people, economically and socially disadvantaged individuals, and people who are underemployed and unemployed. By committing to impact sourcing, employers have access not just to an expanded talent pool, but also to one that demonstrates lower levels of absenteeism and attrition. Impact sourcing is more cost effective than outsourcing arrangements, and most important, provides career development opportunities to people with limited employment prospects. In short, these arrangements benefit everyone. Over the next three years, Everest Group is committed to helping industry partners grow the impact sourcing workforce from 350,000 to 500,000 full-time equivalent workers in the United States. To do this, Everest will work within the impact sourcing ecosystem to develop job readiness programs and encourage incentive programs and hiring mandates that expand opportunities for both employees and employers. The concept of impact sourcing was introduced a decade ago as a way to reduce under and unemployment in developing countries. Now we see it gaining momentum throughout the world as businesses enhance their outreach to talent that has historically been left behind and left out. Going forward, this hiring model has the potential to drive business efficiencies and social justice in any location mm -hmm. and any sector. Mm -hmm. So congratulations to Everest Group on this important commitment to action. So I thought President Clinton would do the best job of explaining what it is that impact sourcing is. And also I have to say, honestly, I got goosebumps the first time I heard him utter those words that uh, many of us on this panel have been working on for a long time. So hopefully you understood from President Clinton what impact sourcing is, that it is a hiring model, it's focused on intentionally bringing in people from marginalized uh, communities into the workforce in the global services industry or BPO, ITS, outsourcing, whatever terminology we want to use. Um, and in many ways, it helps to fulfill social responsibility objectives of companies but the bigger thing is that there is a, a huge benefit to both communities uh, and individuals and the companies. And we've got a few listings of what the target groups look like. And, and in many ways, this is not really uh, an, an exhaustive list because marginalization varies in location to location. So um, if we could, we could uh, turn to the panel, and discuss what is inclusion and impact sourcing look like in your company. And I think, Money, you got us started a little while ago in talking about um, gender and, and other issues, but if you could get us started in talking about what inclusion looks like at, um, at Daisy Crew. Yeah, that's uh, quite inspiring, Rita. Uh, this is the first time I'm hearing the President Clinton talk about impact sourcing. That's a big recognition for the work some of us do. Uh, at Desi Crew, uh, we've always been exploring the uh, economic boundaries. We're trying to extend the economic boundaries. If you look at any country, the development is obviously concentrated on urban conglomerates, uh, and uh, any of the hinterland has a relative disadvantage. So that has been our endeavor. And in that journey, if you look at uh, some of the metrics which we look at impact sourcing, uh, there are a lot of metrics which includes uh, gender and all of that. What Desi Crew has done is we picked up uh, the standard matrices, which is the SDGs. We picked up the three or four, which is relevant to our work. The primary being the uh, provision of decent work and economic growth. And, and naturally uh, correlated to that is the uh, poverty. And more importantly, we also picked up the gender and the education part, because that's a great uh, uh, motivator for all of us. 
uh, you talked about the gender participation. So we are about 70 to 75% uh, of our workforce being women. Uh, in a country where the uh, IT, ITS, the entire industry is still about 30, 35%. So that's a big difference. Uh, it has also got a lot of advantage to our work. And it also helped us to uh, measure our impact on the ground because we know that a uh, lady of the house getting educated and employed profitably has a huge impact on the generation. And on the impact itself, right? A center like Desi Cruz or many of my colleagues, uh, where we were talking about 100 to 150 people getting gainfully employed in a career in a small place, uh, there's an equivalent economic term which all of us can understand easily. Uh, it's provided by uh, Thomas Friedman. Uh, we all know him from his uh, World is Flat book. But subsequently, I had a chance to uh, take him to some of these centers in India. So he wrote another book called uh, uh, Hot, Flat, and Crowded. So here he had put in an equivalence that a center like that, which painfully employs the youth, 100 to 100 people in a small place, is equivalent to adding almost 400 acres of wetland to the geography of that particular area. So I think this is now universal in terms of how we can perceive the benefit that can bring in. And that's how we uh, looked at uh, the uh, impact sourcing at Desi Group. I love that. And, and certainly tweetable uh, lines there, quoting um, uh, Professor Friedman. So that's great. Um, Wendy, continuing the conversation of how impact sourcing is implemented by specialists, do tell us about the approach that Sama has to um, impact sourcing and, and who's getting included. Yeah, absolutely. So um, we've uh, always seen ourselves as, as a bridge employer to people who've got the greatest barriers to employment. So our focus has been primarily on youth and women in underserved communities. We use the uh, World Bank standard for, for poverty and also some additional attributes that help us make sure we're really addressing um, who's got the greatest barriers to employment. So that includes un and underemployed uh, it's where you know you you live. It's household income. It's education level. So basically, the the majority of the the population that we hire, um, while you know incredibly bright and talented, so deeply believe in in um, you know ta talent distribution, uh, but they have not had an opportunity to get that formal education um, or um, have access to to uh, the formal workplace. So most of our workforce comes from. Uh, informal work. So that is really where we've been focused. We have a, a really uh, a clear impact rubric. Um, we've spent quite a bit of time in our history uh, measuring impact as well, doing impact audits with Impact Matters. We completed an RCT, a randomized control trial, um, last year with MIT and Poverty Action Labs to really continue to hone um, how we track and measure our impact. And uh, we're, we're focused on both sort of depth and breadth, um, meaning how are we able to impact um, levels of income, employment post uh, SAMA. So we really see ourselves as a bridge employer. I love that. I love that model of looking at how the rest of the workforce needs to look and, and providing an on-ramp into, into those spaces. It's amazing. So shifting gears a little bit to you, Hane, WebHelp is not a pure play impact sourcing company. You do a lot of different things, but you made a choice to um, embrace impact sourcing. So tell us what the model is at WebHelp for impact sourcing. Yes. Um, so it, indeed, we again, we have 58 countries. And, and in the introduction, you mentioned that um, each country has a different situation. So when I think there's a very important term in impact sourcing, with, which is intentional. Um, and some countries have a model of uh, impact sourcing. And when I explain it to uh, or share it with another country, they tell me like, but we were doing it like 20 years ago because WebHelp was founded in, in 2000. And, and this is really when you realize that it's been in the culture, it's been in the DNA, but no one put a word on it, nor uh, a methodology or, or, you know, very conscious practices. So um, part of our, our, our job in the last years was really to to formalize what was our definition of, of impact sourcing. I really appreciate when Manny and, and Wendy go into details of what it means, um, because part of, part of my job is to also work with the countries and, and define the model for the specific um, labor, labor market. 
Um, and uh, and it's very interesting because sometimes we realize that um, we need to put some boundaries in, in the term impact hiring. Uh, but then uh, I take the example, for instance, of Madagascar, where uh, we had long discussions where um, the teams were like, but any recruitment uh, is impactful when you recruit in Madagascar. But And you're like, yes, but if you hire the top um, diploma, people who have a diploma in Madagascar, does it really sound to you like impact hiring? And then we realized there's so much more than the hiring parts. Everything we do, so we call it impact employment. It's it's more like all the services that you would bring as an employer. You don't have to, but all the, for instance, in Greece, we have a, a lot of refugees. And when we are... Um, guarantors um, uh, vis-a-vis the the, uh, administration. We don't have to do it, but if we weren't doing it, probably um, these colleagues wouldn't come and work for us. Um, The impact uh, career development. So really, do you bring certifications to um, your people when they they come work for for us? In in South Africa, for instance, the team is working to have national qualifications attached to the, the process, which is super important on top of the hiring, it's not just hiring; it's it's really the, the progression, etc. So, we we made a like um, different buckets into impact sourcing uh, from education to hiring, employment, career development, and 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 the challenge is to be very clear internally because there is not a a single definition or it's a, a, a very narrow definition. So always, always being very clear with ourselves um, uh, what it means uh, when we do impact sourcing and impact hiring. I'm on mute. I'm on mute. Sorry. I love that uh, explanation, honey, especially because I, I too uh, appreciate the word intentional in the definition that. Um, I think if if we think about how the sector evolved across the globe, there's a lot of people that have gotten included that weren't necessarily part of inclusion in the past, Uh, but was it intentional? No. Now we have programs around that and very inspiring to hear. Um, So, you know, an important part of actually doing impact sourcing is partnership. Um, And there's a huge ecosystem that has developed over the years across impact sourcing. And again, this slide is not exhaustive in any sense, um, but there's there's this impact sourcing ecosystem that's developed around who's employing folks, who's enabling the folks, and then the folks themselves. Um, and, And maybe even an overlay across these are the companies that are buying these services and and, um, prioritizing that as something that they would like happening in their ecosystem as well. Um, So with that, I wanna pull in Tracy, who um, not only represents an industry association in South Africa, but as she said, she's been there since since pretty much the launch of, of impact sourcing as a term. And in many ways, not just represent South Africa, but sort of the broader enabling community. Excellent. Thanks, Rita. Thanks so much. Yeah, and it's just so wonderful to see where we are now in 2022 after the um, thinking came through in about 2008 and informally launched in 2016 to actually launch the Global Impact Sourcing Coalition. Um, And the stakeholder matrix that you just advised on now is really where we're tapping into from a global perspective. And it's really about shifting mindsets from a buyer's perspective, um, specifically in the global business services, BPO, ITES space. Um, I would love to say that I'm happy that everybody knows what it is and that everybody's bought into it. But um, I think we can all attest to the fact that there's still a lot of education that needs to be done, um, specifically from a buyer's um, perspective. And it's really about shifting how they do business and changing mindsets. Um, and explaining the benefits around it, which is what all of the stakeholders end up doing. Um, What I really enjoy, though, from a South African perspective, where a lot of the model was tested out, and um, both Hane and Wendy mentioned about many have done impact sourcing in the past, but we didn't call it that, and now we do. And what does it actually look like? So if we unpack the South African story a little bit, we had the opportunity to work with many um, stakeholders while building up the concept of impact sourcing and how it can best actually flow through the supply chain from buyer 
through to partnerships, the actual employer themselves, and all of this benefiting um, the, the marginalized individual, because that's part of the definition is looking at the different marginalized individuals that exist across the globe. And we've already mentioned, you know, we have refugees, we have youth, we have females. So with a lot of um, engagement from the BPO, CX, Global Business Services Sector in South Africa, who, as soon as they saw the opportunity to tap into new and additional talent pools and skills pools that had previously not been tapped into, um, and they saw the, the obvious benefits and opportunities, and also for a market like South Africa, which is one of the emerging um, offshore destinations that a lot of uh, source markets like the UK and the US are looking towards to assist in servicing their customers and clients. Um, there was this need to bring more skills and more talent into the market. And one of the benefits that BAPESA has as an industry association for BPO in South Africa is that they partner very intentionally with national and provincial government and then with some social partners. And um, I know a partner that WebHelp works with, for example, called Harambi, um, is an ecosystems change agent, and they just really don't see any problem as a problem. They just see it as something that hasn't been solved. And there's been a lot of sort of methodologies and frameworks that they've built out around that. But what happened with um, national government is that they actually have incentives uh, for the global business services and BPO sector in South Africa. And they took that lever and actually built in impact sourcing into it. Um, at the moment, I believe it's the only country or government that does that. I hope that other governments pick this up because it will really help entrench impact sourcing as a standard practice. But if you are to apply for the incentives in South Africa, if you're running an operation, a BPO operation, and servicing an international community, 20% of your hires have to be impact, um, impact workers. But they've actually gone a, a step further where from a very South African context perspective where um, those who don't know, there's a, a very, very sad statistic where we have a 69% unemployment rate within the youth contingent, which is the ages of 18 to 34, which is insane. Um, so that is the, the target market to employ into the global business services and BPO sector. So 20% of those individuals need to be um, secured from an impact sourcing perspective. But the subset that's actually been crafted and created and put into the incentives is called inclusive hiring. And there's three specific um, criteria that need to be, well, one of the three criteria need to be considered when employing in. The first is that the individual needs to come from a household that earns less than 6,000 South African Rand a month, which is really not a lot of dollars at all. Um, and sadly, it's, it's not difficult to find those individuals because many, many um, families live on social grants in South Africa. The second um, area that could be considered is that the individual has been unemployed for the last six months. Again, not difficult to find, unfortunately. And the third potential area is that the individual needs to have come from a quintile one, two or three school, and that will qualify them as an impact as an impact hire or an inclusive hire. So I just really appreciate the fact that the Department of Trade, Industry and Competition has partnered with the BPO and GBS sector in South Africa in such an intentional way that we can meaningfully drive inclusive hiring and impact sourcing throughout our sector. Um, but what we've also seen, just to sort of end off on that point there, is the amazing amounts of partnerships that have ex that exist in South Africa. So regardless of whether the um, end employer, the BPO operators are um, uh, claiming for incentives or not, they still practice the impact sourcing um, aspect of how they hire in. And we do quarterly jobs reports just to track and see what's happening from a growth perspective. And we're sitting pretty consistently at about a 22, 23% impact higher um, across the board. And we are looking as a country and as a sector to actually grow that at, to 30% um, in the years that go forward. So amazing. And I think you're right about governments um, baking in the concept of impact sourcing. Um, we have heard about in Egypt, there's a requirement on persons with disabilities, even within the private sector. Um, and we do know throughout other countries that the incentives exist for impact sourcing and inclusive hiring practices, but not necessarily baked in in such a concrete manner as in South Africa. Um, and Tracy, thank you for covering the nonprofit and training institutions, um, government as enablers and industry associations. There's also certifications and um, international bodies that are part of this ecosystem as well. And I'm, I'm opening it up to everyone, but I know, Wendy, I, I do want to call out Sama specifically because I believe you're a B Corp and um, 
you know, I think that's that's an interesting and important part of the the ecosystem and how it gets sort of held on your sleeve that that this is a, a an um, an organization that's that has purpose at its center. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we've we've had kind of an interesting path. So uh, as I mentioned, we actually launched in two thousand eight. So definitely uh, part of the pioneering team of of launching into uh, purposeful hiring and. Uh, we actually launched as a nonprofit, um, not not per se, uh, because it was the only path. It was the only path available because this notion of impact sourcing and impact sourcing being a compelling business was um, was uh, was was something that was a bit unusual, I think, at the time for traditional investors. So um, <clears throat> that's actually how we we uh, were were founded um, as we as we grew, um, and uh, this this notion of impact sourcing <clears throat> became, I think more more prevalent. I think what's interesting is is that the way that I really look at it is um, at the end of the day, the the clients are looking for the most outstanding delivery um, that they can possibly get. And that's the first and foremost thing. And the impact is is uh, incredibly important. Um, a cherry on the Sunday, but something that we've always really viewed as as critical to delivering outstanding service, right? So you have dedicated workforce, incredible talent. Um, you can build that 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 talent up to build deep expertise for our clients. And anyhow, long story short is that um, we transitioned into uh, into a for profit, but as part of that process, ensured that we had the governance to make sure that we were still uh, keeping our mission North Star uh, intact. And so that included the B Corp certification, it included impact investment um, as our as our primary form of investment. And um, yeah, I think it's, it's, it's important that we continue to uh, measure. So one of the reasons I like the B Corp framework is because you can score yourself and you're basically encouraged to continue to score and improve. And it keeps another focus on how you can continue to grow the uh, depth and breadth of your impact. I did it again. Um, Ani, Ani, would you like to add uh, some uh, flavor to this ecosystem? Yeah, yeah, Rita. So uh, in Indian context, yeah. I just want to bring in that uh, both the government and the industry bodies like NASCOM have been at the forefront in uh, promoting this idea and extending this idea into hinterlands and uh, broadly modeled on what we've been attempting because we were also born in that era, 2007-8, when the coin name was not coined. So Government of India came up with a policy to uh, create more Desi Crew centers or Desi Crew equivalent centers across India. And they came up with the incentive scheme for anybody who sets up, whether it's a large company or a startup or an entrepreneur. And that has really worked well. We're almost uh, at the fag end of the policy, which has created more centers in all states, which also kind of addresses your inequality and opportunity. Uh, the other point which I want to pick up from Wendy, you talked about the framework. So in the early days of this, we realized that uh, we needed that acknowledgement and recognition from the market saying that whatever we do is not some local, but it also stands up to scrutiny. So we went ahead and uh, published the social audit report. So that is technically it is not for actually our sector because none of the BPOs or IT companies would have published something like that. But uh, we did it because uh, the social audit gave it a little more better framework in terms of testing ourselves, whether our business and our stated objectives are on par. It's almost like a financial audit. So it was done by uh, SA and UK, I think. So that is one of the early things to signal to the market on what are the things being done at the uh, DCQ or the impact sourcing level. And I would like to come in on the market acceptance a little later when we move on to that topic. Fantastic, fantastic. Honey, um, I think uh, Tracy, Tracy preempted you on talking about Harambe, but I think WebHelp, as a large corporation spanning so many countries, you must have a ton of partnerships to, to make this for real. Yes, yes, I think last time we counted uh, for our latest UN Compact, we have we had about sixty partnerships across across the globe, um, and it's true. I mean, I can come back on the Harambe partnership because for Web Help, it's the first intentional and largest one um, uh, we've ever had. 
Um, and, and, and quoting Katie, Kathy, who is the uh, CHRO for, for South Africa, it's, it's been and it, it continues to be a, an amazing journey. And, and they choose really Harambe again very intentionally because they had the knowledge of um, the, the target population um, and also the understanding of, of the business. I think it's, um, it, this is what I hear sometimes when the partner um, doesn't know enough about what you do as a job, then there, there can be a lot of mismatch or, or lack of training, etc. So the choice and the time we spend on um, uh, with 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 future partners is is incredibly important to set the right path after um, um, for for all the let's say sometimes experimentation that, that that's what happened in South Africa. So they started in 2016, and I think they had at least five different um, models, um, always starting with pilots, which I think is incredibly important um, to secure uh, the beginning of the partnership. Um, but they started with, with, with a very small pilot eternally, and um, then they moved to a permanent model with like more than 250 um, uh, young people. Then they went for the peak model, which was like a huge jump, but the clients, and I'll come back after on partnership with organization, big work, but now we need also to work with clients. And that client was incredible because he he let us um, do the peak period, so not permanent, but the peak periods only um, uh, through an impact hiring model, um, which could seem like a bet, but because the pilots had been so successful, he knew, um, um, and, and Wendy talked about uh, the the outstanding service that client expect, the client knew that it was going to work. Um, and more recently, uh, the team in South Africa worked on a model on disability learnership. Um, so they, they shift, I mean, not, not shifted completely from the youth, but they focused on uh, youth with a disability, um, still with the the qualification uh, also uh, bringing at, at the end, and now they've launched a retail skills accelerator. So it takes time for sure, um, but um, but yeah, the, the the pilots that they've they've made and the measurements again, when she talked about the um, measurements, it's very important to prove prove your case. So setting the systems to be able to measure um, has an incredible incredible um, value. Um, so that's that's one example, but throughout the countries you can find other, and, and I want to pay tribute to all the teams working on the ground, very creative, finding new models. Um, I think of Latin America, for instance, they built, um, with support of the government and other companies, a language studio. So basically, if you... Um, you arrive and, and you fail at the language test uh, in English in, in Latin America, you can go to a three weeks course, free course, um, and then take take the take test again, um, and ninety nine percent of the cases the candidates are are accepted, and the impact there is tremendous because the moment you are able to um, go on a multilingual campaign or an uh, an English campaign, then you you can double your salary basically. So, so working working on the English part for me right now the so many times I see that. The candidates are missing the English piece is mm-hmm. is something critical for for the future. But again, partnership is one thing with the governments, with the the NGOs who know the 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 yeah the target populations. The next challenge is is working and partnering with the clients so that it becomes more systematic that um, we integrate impact sourcing within all of our campaigns um, and missions. Um, but we need to bring more figures um, to show that the model uh, works. <laughs> Great. And hopefully President Clinton helps us with, uh, exactly. <laughs> with that. Now, I'm not seeing a lot of questions and I'm guessing it's because we're really sort of in that mode of really talking about technicalities, but now we're talking about impact on people, real people's lives. So hopefully this is the audience that cares about that and oops, wrong direction. But before we get directly into the team and and the impact that they've had, um, I wouldn't be doing my job as an analyst if I didn't give you a little sense of what the numbers look like. So we did a study earlier this year to look at the entire impact sourcing market and how many people do we identify as impact workers. 
Um, and the overarching population is about 350,000 people globally. Um, uh, you know, a small percentage, the 15, 13 to 15% are specialists like uh, Sama and Desi crew. And the most interesting part of that to me was that we're no longer in a situation where the only job that's being done is uh, a call center job or, or a non-call center, but very uh, BPS voice. Still a large percentage of the teams are working on those functions, but it's expanding and particularly into the digital arena. And, and um, we definitely heard from Money and, and Wendy on this subject. Um, so to me, that's very exciting that the, the areas that are coming up for data labeling, annotation, AIML training, um, it's, it's broadened this and made it more global. Um, then the, la the, la the last slide that I do want to share is in our study. Um, this is just a map of where impact sourcing specialists are. Sorry, honey, I, I couldn't fit. I couldn't fit all of the countries that you're operating in here. But I, I think the exciting thing to me is that when we first started this activity, there was a huge focus on South Asia, specifically India and Africa. Um, and now we see this as a true global phenomenon, um, the recognition that there's there's marginalized communities that can be included across the globe. Um, and, and it's just a very exciting phenomenon. So um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen now and ask um, Tracy, I think maybe we could get started with you to talk a little bit about how impact sourcing has expanded across Africa. I know your focus is on South Africa, but I think your your passion lies around the expansion across the continent. No, without a doubt, absolutely. Thanks, Rita. So there may be a slight bias towards South Africa, but definitely the passion point is Africa as a continent. And um, we're certainly seeing it coming into its own at the moment. So um, we've mentioned the Global Impact Sourcing Coalition, which was the organization or the framework that was launched back in 2016 and kindly um, hosted from a secretariat perspective by BSR with all of the data that we already had from Everest um, to support the initiative. And the logos that you had on screen earlier were those founding organizations that got involved. Um, and there was a lot that was done with the creation of a standard to make sure that, you know, if someone said that they were doing impact sourcing, that it was actually there. Um, and it's a self, um, it's a self uh, certification piece that they have at the moment that's still there. But ultimately, once they'd kind of done their job and gotten more players involved and we had the collateral in that, um, they went into what I'm going to call hibernation. So the, the information still exists and a lot of the organizations, some of us on this call and others, kind of picked up the mantle and carried on running. So BAPESA um, currently sits as the custodian of the um, impact sourcing chapter for Africa, and then working with a number of countries across the um, continent um, with a, a bias towards the global business services and BPO sector. But what's really exciting is just how quickly Africa has actually come into its own. Um, and this, I would say, was there was the, the nascent opportunity that existed pre-COVID, and I don't know if it's COVID that did it, or just the realization of the amazing service, the availability of talent and skill across the African continent. But we've seen countries like Ethiopia, Rwanda, uh, Kenya, um, Uganda's got a bit happening, Ghana, um, Nigeria, um, Botswana's got some, some, some um, great models happening. But each and every one of these emerging markets, um, as you referenced earlier, across the globe, there are marginalized communities and these countries are no different. So it's really about working with those organizations and um, sharing best practice and um, to Hannah's earlier point, really embedding um, the practice of impact sourcing and intentional and purposeful um, hiring into the models that exist. Um, we're seeing some of the um, global BPOs that already have a footprint in Africa adopting it in a big way. Um, we're seeing some new emerging players um, who have already built up kind of a, a supply and employment model. Um, an example would be one of the Rockefeller partners that originally came up and tested out the impact sourcing model um, called CareerBox. 
Um, they've partnered with a number of other organizations to really sort of scale it out. And to your earlier point, didn't only stick to GBS. I mean, they were doing some stuff in the retail area as well. But um, their um, employer is CCI. It's their partner company. And CCI, being the largest um, BPO in South Africa, has expanded their footprint. Um, they're busy setting up or they've just launched in Ethiopia. They're in Kenya. So it's really taking a model that's been tried and tested in South Africa, taking it further. And then we have others that are coming sort of um, north-south down into South Africa and adopting the model uh, to make sure that from an African-wide perspective that we're tapping into that skills base. And I think I just want to end by saying that, to me, this is a perfect circle and a natural progression that happened. Um, when the Rockefeller Foundation originally um, launched what was actually called Digital Jobs Africa, which is where impact sourcing was born out of, um, the whole problem statement was that Africa has the largest youth contingent on the, on the planet. And how was um, Rockefeller going to play a meaningful role to really engage with these youth to get them into the world of work? And ultimately, what was realized is that literacy of the future is digital, hence Digital Jobs Africa. And that sort of, you know, ran its path. And that's where impact sourcing was born and the global impact sourcing um, space, uh, realized, you know, had a need to employ these skills in. And that's where it all sort of came from. So I'm just really excited that it's run its full circle now and that there's just such an appetite from so many of the employers and the, the service providers to partner together, to co-create and to educate the clients. And many of the clients are actually insisting on it now. And it's falling into that ESG and that diversity, equity and inclusion mandate that they have. So exciting to see. I agree. I agree. Some of the smaller countries that were there on our map um, were because of a company called Isahit, who has a slightly different model. They are more gig workers and um, their requirement is actually not full-time work because the, and it's purely women focused and they, they ask the women to have an objective in getting these digital skills, whether it's earning funds for, for, uh, for education or starting a small business or they need the digital skills for other things that they're doing. So I, I think you're right. This is, this is an exciting time. Um, I'm starting to see questions coming in, so I'm going to keep priming the pump here and say, please do to send your questions. We have a lot of uh, amazing experience here. Um, Hane, I, I want to put you on the spot now because I had my globe up and it did not include where all you're operating. And, and the fact is that you're you're across the globe. So I, I wondered if you could comment on what your view is of the impact in the impact sourcing that you're having as a company? Um, yes, you mean the impact on on the, the new colleagues we hire every every day and every month? Yeah, yeah. So, and I think that's very important when when you start getting into that work of making it very intentional to actually go and and speak and and be on the ground to understand the impact because it. You know, it's it, it really demultiplies the energy uh, and and the passion, um, and I think the first thing you hear will be that um, the the new colleagues are are able to provide for themselves and and for their family, um, and that's the first step, um, and then and then they will see like every opportunity that happens. So we we are lucky to be in, in a um, international um, company, um, and there is a lot of I mean, we insist on the internal promotion. So um, more than 60% of our uh, positions are filled in internally. So it means the piece of career development is is a reality because uh, it makes me think of one colleague we, we did a, an interview for recently where he started as an advisor and then he moved as a subject matter expert and then as a trainer. But he could go for workforce management or he could go for any other function basically internally. Um, so that's that's really the impact, both first providing for your 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 family and your immediate needs, um, and and then growing, um, growing within the, the industry and becoming experts, um, basically. So always going and speaking with first the associations, but most and foremost the, the new colleagues um, is is an advice I would I would say to understand the impact. And Hane, can you just remind us how many countries are you doing impact sourcing? And, and I think you have 
a fairly uh, robust target on the percentage of employees that you you aim to have as impact workers. Yes. So right now, so the, the figures change month by month because we acquired a new company recently. Um, but we're now in 58 countries and in half of them, we have um, uh, impact hiring initiatives. And I have to say, it's not necessarily the countries you would think of. I know sometimes I talk about France or Spain, and we do have uh, initiatives there, uh, for instance, for France, because in some areas you have a very um, high unemployment because industries have left, for instance, I think, for instance, of the north of France. Um, so we've developed strong partnerships there. Um, also sometimes with international organizations uh, like Generation, for instance, we have same partnership but as well in Spain so that's that's interesting and in Spain for instance I have in mind one organization we work with MigraCode and they provide digital skills well coding skills for migrants um, so that's also interesting because sometimes you have to discuss with organizations maybe it's not coding that we need um, since we, we talk about IT but maybe it's more like IT help desk and then having the discussion uh, with the, the organization, you switch or you add a new uh, curriculum to the, to, to the course they provide. And then it makes your partnership flourish um, as well. And that makes me think of a, a graphic designer who is a refugee from Venezuela who came to, um, to Spain and now he's working um, in um, IT, IT help desk. Fantastic. Really inspiring. So speaking of inspiring, Wendy, do tell us more about what you've seen and impact. And you referenced the RCT from the MIT Poverty Lab. Um, tell us about the impact you've had and and over the the decade. Decades. Yeah, thank you. This is this is definitely a very fun topic, and I um, also really appreciate what what Hane said. I think that career growth is a really huge part of it. So I'll, I'll touch on a, a couple of items. But yes, we're we're super excited. So uh, recently, we surpassed over sixty thousand lives impacted, um, which was really exciting. So it was a big milestone. I remember when we were thrilled to be at ten thousand, and uh, uh, we're very excited to to uh, to uh, you know continue to drive um, impact. In terms of the um, RCT, so the rent, it's a randomized control trial, and uh, it's a, it was a really really interesting process. So it's very similar to what you might. Uh, I think the easiest way to describe it would be like when you're trying to to um, you know have a, a pass a drug through the FDA. You've got you know kind of your your control groups, your um, your control groups, and um, what we did at Sama is we actually started this all the way back in 2016, where we started to collect data between a few different control groups. So. Um, the population that would normally get the SAM intervention, um, so that would be training and hiring, a group that would have uh, just um, training, and then, of course, the base control group, which is no training, no hiring. And what was really interesting is we collected thousands of people's worth of data over the course of three years. And probably the most interesting thing is that um, three years after um, we completed the study, uh, women um, who received the SAM intervention were almost three times higher um, paid as well as three times higher employed. And so this notion of a purposeful intervention, giving that opportunity um, really proved that jobs beget jobs. When you take that intentional hiring approach where you give somebody an opportunity that they would not have the access to the network um, network for or any of the professional um, skills, uh, it makes a significant impact in both their, their livelihoods and their opportunities. So this this uh, very intentional process is, is something that um, I, I think we're, we're just absolutely thrilled about because it kind of proved that that model. It's not just that, you know, hey, we're, we're, we're hiring in emerging areas and, and you know, maybe these people would have succeeded on there and you know, succeeded it. It really proves that that access is, is absolutely huge because if you hire, think about it this way, you can you can hire. Um, most people hire based off of professional experience and you know college degrees, where you went to school. But what if you did the opposite, which is the approach that we've taken, and uh, it's 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 pretty exciting. Um, in terms of uh, some of the the stories, I mean, gosh, there are are too many to tell. I, I just spent a, a couple of weeks uh, in our offices in in Nairobi, Gulu, and in, in Kampala, and it's amazing. Um, half of my manage, you know, I, I talked to my managers um, and even some of the senior senior managers and beyond, and, and they were former impact associates. 
And here they are, you know, a few years later, managing large client engagements, client facing. And I think the thing that's most fascinating is um, between all the different stories of, you know, I felt empowered to leave an abusive relationship to um, I'm supporting my, you know, sisters, brothers, uh, you know, I built a house for my, you know, for my mom up country, those kinds of things. Um, beyond that, I, I think it's really the transformation, Rita, that I think is so, so amazing going from having sort of no confidence, right? Like, this is what I do. You know, I, I have, I'm working in the formal, informal sector to, I can do anything, you know? <laughs> so I was talking to uh, a, a young woman who was a mother and she's like, yeah, she's like, I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to get my computer science degree. And, you know, this is uh, somebody who, you know, had been um, working as household help, you know, previously. And that kind of transformation is the stuff that is just so incredibly inspiring. It's amazing. The potential that exists for every single individual in this world. It's absolutely incredible based on options and jobs beget jobs. I don't know if anybody's tweeting. Uh, I'm not on, I don't have, I don't have enough windows to, to see, but I feel like we've had such good nuggets of information that's come out of this. Um, money, last words on on impact and Daisy crew. Yeah, sure. Uh, Rita, and I endorse uh, Wendy's statements in terms of how the transformation is happening and the people who uh, come up to associate with us. And I think that's happening now across the world. But I would like to just point two things more, which is again, intentional from inside perspective, right? So it's obvious that the monetary impact uh, is pretty huge on the uh, families because of the relative importance of uh, the uh, income. But it also important for the global market that uh, skills and leadership also get inbuilt as part of the offerings from people like Desi. So the examples which Wendy gave, uh, we do have similar things when we saw the entire family getting excited because their kid is flying out for the first time out of the country to go and manage a project in a new country, in a new environment, new client. So this is not something which they signed up for. And uh, this experience adds to a lot of other inspirational people, both friends and families, and even outside the the secret environment. So we have our own online uh, skilling platform, for example. So where we are saying that you can get skilled in a particular skill, even though that's not your current skill. So you're working for a client A, but you're actually getting trained for client B at your own convenience, using your mobile at your home. And there are certifications and things like that, which enables you to become a leader, even if you're not with us. And leadership, the uh, they see the way it is grown. Obviously, it's bottoms up, right? We couldn't get anybody to convince from Mumbai and Delhi to move to our uh, villages. Uh, having said that, we are now a heady mix of both uh, the market people as well as the homegrown leaders. And I have about 100 people who have grown up along with this crew, started with the very meager salaries in the initial days, but grew with the clients, grew with the expertise. Now they're managing their own processes and centers. Now, these leaders are the foundation on which this crew or any other organization can be uh, built upon. And I also want to quickly touch upon uh, what Tracy said the Circle and Rockefeller Foundation Initiative. I think 10 years is almost since we uh, did that Accenture report, which gave some numerical numbers about the market demand and so on. I remember at that time, uh, but when I looked at that report again for uh, this meeting, when I realized that we have completely missed out two important words, that is A and ML. So maybe it is not part of the industry at that time. So now that has completely transformed the way we work and the demand for impact sourcing. So from the periphery, I think AML is going to integrate the impact sourcing into the core because whether it's a startup or whether you are the largest enterprise in the world, today you are embarking on AML mission, which is almost impossible without, or you can do it, but it's a lot more efficient if you partner with an IS company because the work is taking you to the end users. Right. In BPO, there's a term called near shoring. So you go and place yourself near your customer side. But I see it differently. That near shoring today means going near your end user. So if an ASR is getting developed for a language, let's say in Oriya. So it's important for us to be uh, to close to people who speak and who are born and brought up in Oriya than New York. So a lot of changes I see in the uh, market. 
and probably with this 10 years time we also completed the malcolm galdwell's 10000 hours of apprenticeship so maybe the time is right and we can look forward for more better things and i'm hoping and wishing that for everyone fantastic thank you money um so we're getting towards the end of our panel and we do have one question but i wanted to before moving to the q and a just do a, a quick call to action um first of all if you're involved already in this space if you're creating jobs or you're buying services please join the pledge um please join the impact sourcing pledge that we're we've taken with um the Clinton Global Initiative we know that there's so much more potential um if you do this kind of work and are interested in learning more um let's get in touch but if you if you uh are a buyer of these services here are three amazing companies to talk to they see crew sama and web help are doing incredible work as you've heard um not just having impact but also delivering amazing results when you think you, you called it the cherry on top which i like um and if you really just want to understand what your country what your government what your local government needs to be doing and can be doing you know we've got tracy that's been giving us the south africa perspective but uh but an amazing wealth of knowledge and having been there from the get go as well um so right now i just see one question and that is from arun kumar asking about what kind of research and development is needed for the current model of impact sourcing to make a bigger impact globally um and as a as a researcher um on the panel i'll say um i think the the three areas that i think of are what we discussed today what is the actual impact on ground uh what are the operations that are making this successful to reach those kpis all of that I think the second area is the buyers of these services. How is this fitting into their sustainability goals? Um how is it that that we can make the information that much more accessible so that they see e there is an S in the ESG and social uh, you know needs to be part of that that conversation. And the third is the 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 wider global perspective on what are effective incentive programs um what are effective uh, standards that can be put in place kind of broadening that circle of uh the ecosystem um and i i open it up to the panelists to add or or comment or or disagree uh with anything that i said as well Rita thanks i'd like to add two other points in there and perhaps this is one of the shifts that the buyers need to see because um we kind of we are interesting creatures as as human beings we don't we want change but we don't like change so when we come and suggest you know let's do the impact sourcing model with you and this is why it works and we've got a lot of stats and data they don't always necessarily see um they don't want to be the first one to go and change but there's two aspects the one from an ESG perspective with a lot of organizations they're literally taking the jobs to the people um again I know covid shifted this anyway with work from home but that means less hours on the road so we're producing less uh, uh carbon emissions and that type of idea so it definitely ties in you know taking through to an impact community a marginalized community taking the jobs that ticks a lot of the ESG boxes but then there's another thing which is the unconscious bias that we don't realize we have if we continue recruiting from the same talent pool to service our consumer base we automatically have an unconscious bias so we need to start growing and diversifying the agents the consultants those very individuals that are servicing the consumers but then the back end and here's another cherry on top windy is that we're building up our own new consumer base because those individuals now become part of the global economy so those clients are actually just building up an expanded consumer base for themselves fantastic on a money wendy would you like to add anything or even just some closing thoughts um i think we're at time exactly but i might just tag on one more um i love what tracy just said by the way um is that one of the the, the things areas we we hadn't touched on is that you know in addition to becoming consumers people leave and they they build their own ecosystems we've had plenty of people go and start their own businesses um 
in technology, some in ICT, some in not. We actually track all that. It's an amazing thing because what you're doing is you're taking all those digital skills, but equivalently, importantly, soft skills and bringing them out into market. And the whole goal is to have a ripple effect. So um, I think that's uh, really well said, Tracy. And um, Rita, thank you so much. Thanks to everybody. It's a, a great panel. Thank you. Thank you so much. Honey, I see you going off mute. Please Please share. Oh, yeah. The the one point about going globally is also setting yourself, um, I think, targets. Originally, we set ourselves 5% of our new recruits. We were very conservative, but at the end, we reached 10%. And this year, it looks again 10% and more. So going, you know, setting an ambitious target uh, and then and then monitoring it. Um, and this way you make you make a bigger impact globally um, to answer Aaron's question as well. <laughs> and honey, if, if every large provider um, combined with with the, the specialist providers were to do 10 percent, we would blow the 500,000 goal out of the water and completely exceed it uh, in, in a heartbeat. So Kudos, kudos to Web Help for doing that. It's amazing. Thank you. Um, Money, do you have any last words? Uh, yeah, on the uh, research part, uh, Rita, I think, uh, like I said, the first one was Accenture. And the next one, I can only think of Everest report. I'm not sure whether there is something in between came and I missed, but... The uh, NASCOM Foundation. NASCOM Foundation, but we would like to see more of that uh, with more frequency and more coverage because that's one way of sending a message to the market. And of course, there are discerning buyers who are going to uh, rip it apart and ask the tough questions. But that's one sure way to ensure that we measure up to the standards, which will in turn impact the entire ecosystem. Great. On that note, I think I'm handing the uh, microphone over to the organizers. Thank you all so much for being here and thank you to the panelists for such a great conversation.